Hi, everyone. Thanks, Laura. Um, I am excited today to have this double feature of uh, Predator Prey program interns, um, Gabriel Batista, who we'll hear from first, followed by Stephen Gabriel. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce Gabriel now. Um, Gabriel Batista is a resident of West Palm Beach, Florida. Um, he comes to us as a 2019 graduate from Florida International University. Um, with a Bachelor's of Science in Biology. Um, he's had a, a range of, of occupations before. He's been a Nature Preserve volunteer, um, done an internship um, through FIU um, in tropical conservation, working on invasive species. Um, he's uh, worked on an REU project, um, doing um, forest uh, resource me measurements um, for Penn State University. Um, and he's going to talk with us today about uh, the relationship between bob occupancy and cattle ranches. So um, without further ado, uh, take it away, Gabriel. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to my presentation. Um, so the title of my presentation is uh, When the Cows Sleep, the Cats Come Out to Play, uh, a, a Spatial Temporal Analysis of Bobcat Cattle Interactions on a Florida Ranch. So I'll start off with some bobcat uh, basics to introduce my study species. So bobcats are a medium-sized cat. They're mostly crepuscular with some activity throughout the night. Uh, they breed in the fall, winter, and spring. They're habitat generalists. And they're also generalists when it comes to hunting. Um, they're primarily solitary unless uh, they're mating. So my research question is really how do bobcats adapt to living in an agricultural setting? Um, I think this is an important question to ask. We don't really know too much about it. And yeah, so my first question regarding this is how do they interact with cattle? Uh, are bobcats avoidant? Are they attracted? or do they feel neutral towards cattle? Also, I wanna know what kind of habitats do they prefer? Do they prefer grassland? Do they prefer oak hammock, wetland? Um, what about more or less disturbed areas, such as improved pastures and semi-native pastures? And I'll touch on that later. Um, I also wanna ask, what does a 24 hour day look like for a bobcat living on a ranch? And how are they responding temporally to the presence of cattle? Next, I also want to ask, are there, do we see any seasonal differences when it comes to all of these things? So an overview of my study, the, the first part, I'm going to map bobcat detections, and I'm going to highlight uh, high bobcat activity zones throughout the ranch, and I'm also going to map cattle use. Next, I'm going to conduct an occupancy model to, see, to estimate bobcat occupancy and detection probability. I also want to test cattle use and habitat as covariates, and also test seasonal differences. I also wanna see uh, a 24 hour activity of bobcats, so I'm gonna graph uh, daily bobcat activity. So this is the camera grid at the ranch. There's 44 cameras, uh, white flash activated uh, within a one kilo kilometer grid cells. There's 10 photos per trigger, uh, that are taken every time uh, an animal passes by the camera in a five minute qu quiet period after that trigger. Uh, so that means that no photos are taken for those five minutes. And the study period that I chose is 2016. So here's what a sample bobcat sequence looks like. Pretty neat. Um, the study site is Buck Island Ranch. The habitat types are improved pasture, semi-native pasture, oak and palm hammock, and wetlands. There's 10,500 acres and, or, and about 3,000 cattle. So the difference uh, between semi-native uh, versus improved pastures is really important to, to highlight. Um, so semi-native pastures are historically unfertilized and they are less disturbed. There's less ditches and, and such. Uh, they are grazed primarily in the winter time and there's less forage for cattle. 
and a higher degree of native plants. For improved pasture, on the other hand, they're historically fertilized uh, and have been ditched extensively. They are grazed in the summertime primarily, and there's more forage for cattle and less native plants, uh, primarily made up of bahia grass. So on the left, you see a picture of a camera trap researcher in a wetland, and on the right, you see a camera facing a palm and oak hammock. So first part of my project is mapping bobcat detection. So here's a map of Buck Island Ranch. Um, sorry, I forgot to do that. <laughs> here's a map of Buck Island Ranch and um, there's the 44 cameras. So the numbers correspond to the, to the cameras. The size of the bubble corresponds to the number of images of bobcats detected. So the bigger the bubble, the more bobcats we saw. And the color of the bubble corresponds to the cattle use at that site. Uh, and so the blues are the lowest use and the reds are the highest use. And the way that, that was calculated was by uh, calculating how many uh, images of cattle were detected for the entire period, which was a year in this case, uh, and then using quantiles to uh, assess, you know, 25%. Uh, of each of the data classes. So the, the, the ones are uh, the lowest 25% and the fours are the highest 25%. So these two maps here uh, show, the one on the left shows low detections of bobcats and the one on the right shows the higher detections of bobcats. And uh, as the one, the one on the left is pretty spread out uh, and a lot of the activity is also occurring here in the improved pastures. However, for the higher detection sites uh, on the range for bobcats, uh, they're primarily seen in the semi-native pastures, which are highlighted in these uh, gray outlines. So wherever you see these gray outlines, that represents uh, uh, a semi-native pasture. So most of these high, high, high bobcat use sites are occurring in the semi-native pastures. And that's pretty interesting finding just from a visual perspective. Now these four maps show uh, the cattle use throughout the ranch, uh, one through four. Um, for the lowest cattle use, I see that most of that low cattle use is really occurring in semi-native pastures again. Um, and for the highest cattle use, it's occurring uh, in the improved pastures. Um, as well as the semi-native. For all, all four sites though, are pretty evenly spread out, I would say. And I think that has a lot to do with that this, uh, these maps are for a year's worth of data. So it's not highlighting the seasonal effect of cattle movement. So the cattle move throughout the ranch, uh, change from pasture to pasture. Again, this is for the entire year. And later on, I'm gonna focus on the, the seasonal effect. So the second part of my project is modeling occupancy. And now what are occupancy models? So the purpose of an occupancy model is to estimate um, species occurrence at a site um, while accounting for imperfect detection. So occup occupancy is defined as the probability that an area is occupied by species of interest and detection probability is this, the probability of finding that species given that it is actually at that site. And what a, a, a way to visualize this is when you survey an area, uh, you have a binary outcome uh, when detecting a species. You see the species or you don't see it. Now the reality of that is either the species is actually there and is occupying that site or the species is not there or the species is there and you did not see it. So this is key for getting a true estimate of like actual occupancy. You have to account for that imperfect detection. On the left here is a sample of, um, of a bobcat detection history. Um, just chose four days and 14 sites. I subsetted my data just to show you guys. And for site eight here, we would say, wow, site eight is occupied because there are detections occurring at that site. If you see a one in that history, we, we say it's occupied. And 
uh, when when we can translate this mathematically and uh, to to kind of which is what the model is going to do to predict uh, the, the 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 occupancy and the detection probability. And so we get the probability of the detection history of the, of the detection history being one zero one one, and the way you calculate is that you account you do psi, which is occupancy, times the probability of the de of a detection, times the probability of non detection, times probability of detection, and the times the probability of detection. And it's it looks complicated, but it's, it's really simple once you break it down. And then we look at uh, site 11, and we say that it's unoccupied because there are no detections in the sampling period. And mathematically, the way you translate that is um, the probability of uh, non-detection plus the probability of non-occupancy four times, because there's zero, uh, four, four times there are zero non-detections, and then times the probability of uh, occupancy, because you have to account that there's a possibility that that site uh, is occupied, however, uh, no bobcats were detected. Uh, and then you take that, uh, the 44 detection histories, and you can model the likelihood of the occupancy and the detection probability. And so another way of visualizing this is you have your detection history and the underlying biological reality of that is seen in the in the dark dark and light squares represent whether or not there's occupancy occurring at those sites. And so you could get a detection of history of zero zero zero, but that, that site might actually be occupied. Now I'm going to start off with some summary statistics um, for my findings. Uh, I saw a total of six thousand eight hundred and twenty bobcat images. And this includes the bursts, the 10 picture bursts. I saw a total of 800,000 cattle images. In the wet season, uh, from June 1st to July 20th, uh, there were 92 days in which bobcats were detected. And out of a total of 2,200 uh, 2, trap nights, which is the number of cameras uh, times the sampling period, which is 50. And so that's just the the total range of possible days that you could detect something. Um, so the naive occupancy for this time period was 0 0.52. That means we just saw 23 Bob, uh, uh, tw that 23 sites out of 44 were had a detection of a bobcat. Now this naive occupancy doesn't account for detection probability. And then uh, number of cattle images is uh, 1,000. Uh, uh, 130,000. So for the dry season, I chose January 8th to March 5th, uh, and we saw 151 days with bobcats detected uh, out of, again, 2,200 trap nights. Naive occupancy was 0 0.57. So the, the naive occupancy was higher during this time period, and also the number of days in which bobcats were detected was higher, and 90,000 cow inches. So this graph here shows uh, bobcat detections for the whole year uh, divided by month. And the most, the highest density of detections is occurring in, uh, in January, February, uh, kind of the dry winter. For cattle, on the other hand, it's occurring uh, around springtime to early summer. And so let me get into the results of my occupancy model. So the psi symbol here on top represents um, the occupancy estimate that the model predicted. And it was 0 0.53, which was really close to the naive estimate. And the, on the below, that is the detection probability, which is 0 0.08. So it, there's a low detection probability. And uh, that's pretty consistent with the literature. Like um, we know that bobcats are relatively common species seen like throughout, but they are hard to detect. They're a cryptic kind of species. Um, now, with regards to occupancy, I saw a significant positive effect on occupancy by semi native pasture type. And for detection probability, I saw a significant interaction between the number of cattle images and pasture type. So this graph shows uh, the predicted occupancy um, by pasture type for the for the wet season. 
Um, and here we see that the improved pastures uh, had a lower predicted occupancy and that the semi-native pastures had a higher predicted occupancy. Here shows the predicted detection probability by pasture type in the wet season. And here we see uh, a clear negative trend with increasing number of cow images for both pasture types and, a, and that the detection probability for uh, improved pastures is dropping really steeply with increasing number of cattle very quickly. And however, the, the semi-native pasture is a bit more resilient to that increase in number of cattle images for detection probability. Now for the drive season, uh, my occupancy estimate was 0 0.57 and my detection probability was 0 0.12. Um, for my covariates, I saw a significant interaction between the number of cattle images and pasture type. For detection probability, I saw a significant positive effect by semi-native pasture type and a significant negative effect with increasing number of cattle. Uh, and that's not shown here in the p-values. Um, okay, so this graph here is the same graph we saw before just for the dry season. And again, uh, we see a clear negative trend for both improved and semi-native pasture with the increasing number of cattle. And that semi-native pastures have a higher you know, uh, detection probability throughout. Uh, they start higher and they end higher. Um, for, and, uh, and the improved pasture is lower. Now, this is not a significant interaction between the cattle images and pasture type. Uh, and what that means is that uh, the effect that cattle, the number of cattle images had uh, on the two pasture types on bobcat detection probability was not significantly different. So if you look at the wet season, you can tell that the, the, the improved pasture had a, a different response to, to the increase in number of, of cattle. Um, but here, the effect is pretty similar. However, the, the trend, the negative trend is still consistent. Now this gra graph uh, shows the predicted occupancy with, um, with pasture type um, for the dry season. Um, and this is a pretty interesting finding because the model is predicting an increase in occupancy with higher numbers of cattle, so specifically for the semi-native because the air bars on the improved pasture are really wide. So it's mostly an effect that we're seeing in the, in the semi-native pasture. And that's interesting because before we're seeing the bobcats are kind of avoiding them, but why is this suggesting an increase in occupancy? Uh, and the way I see this is that in the dry season, the semi-native pasture types have a higher uh, a cattle image count. So there's probably more cattle occurring in those semi-native pastures. And we know from, uh, from the work that's done in the ranch is that they move the cattle uh, to the semi-native pastures in the, in the winter months. And in the wet season, there's more in the improved and less in the semi-native. And I think that's what it is driving that effect. So the, the model is predicting that higher occupancy uh, with higher cattle, in, uh, cattle image count. Um, and I think it's mostly an effect of the, the bobcats preferring that semi-native pasture, but uh, choosing to you know, stay despite increasing numbers of cattle. And here's uh, the map you saw previously, but just with the data subset to be just the, uh, the, the dry season. And here we're seeing uh, that the highest cattle scores are occurring in those semi-native pastures in the south and in the northeast. However, in the, in the wet season, uh, that's kind of reversed. And the, especially in the northeast here, these, there's more blues and uh, a few more blues in the, spurs, in the south marsh. Now, the last part of my project, I graphed daily bobcat activity. So this is what a typical day for a bobcat looks like. Now on the x-axis, you have the, um, the time of the day and that's centered around midnight because bobcats are nocturnal primarily. And what I'm seeing here is an increase in activity in the sunset times. 
So that yellow band is represents, the two yellow bands represent sunset and sunrise. And so there's an increase when sunset comes in, they're active throughout the night, uh, and it starts to drop, drop off in sunrise. Now here I've overlaid cattle, um, and I changed the, the x-axis to be centered on noon. Um, and so the, as, as the cattle are picking up their activity in, in the sunrise times, the bobcats are you know, winding down and dropping off. And you know, bob, uh, cattle are diurnal, bobcats are nocturnal. So now this is a really interesting graph. Um, here I, here the, the, the black curve uh, represents bobcat activity during uh, low cattle use days. And the blue line represents um, bobcat activity during high cattle use days. And what we're seeing here is uh, a decrease in activity in the sunset time. So that yellow color represents a decrease in activity from low to high cattle use for bobcats. And they're increasing their activity in this nocturnal window. Um, and again, they're dropping, a, they're dropping activity in sunrise. So essentially what this means is, is that the bobcats are shifting their activity um, towards more, to be more nocturnal on days that there's higher cattle. And the way I define high cattle use is, you know, I, I gave every day a, a, a number of cattle detected and using that I, you know, uh, made categories, uh, the low and high cattle use days. And this uh, coefficient at the bottom represents um, the overlap of the two curves uh, and it's 0.83. So they're like 83% similar. And I know another way to say that is that they're 17% different and when it comes to the same species, that's uh, something to not be ignored. Uh, now this graph represents just bobcat activity in the wet and dry season. And I just did this because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't seeing some, that that last graph wasn't being driven by a, a seasonal effect. And these two curves look pretty similar. Um, yeah. In the wet season, uh, there's kind of more of this like cyclical up and down motion. And I feel like that's the bobcats going hunting, you know, they're winding down, eating, and then coming back up. However, in the dry season, it's more gradual. Anyways, conclusion. So for my occupancy model, I saw that for semi-native pastures uh, led to an increase in occupancy and an increase in detection probability. So that that's pretty clear to me that it's suggesting that the bobcats are, uh, are more likely to be there. They have this preference for semi-native pastures that stays despite uh, increases in cattle presence. Um, and we saw that in the predicted occupancy graph. Uh, and there's uh, no preference for hammock and wetland habitats. Now, I'm not showing those results, but I did test them. Now, with regards to the interaction with cattle, um, with higher cattle came lower detection probability. So the bobcats appear to be avoiding cattle, so they're less likely to be detected. However, that overall occupancy doesn't really decrease that much. So they're still, you know, occupying those sites despite increases in cattle, just less likely to see them. So with the bobcat detection map, I saw a vis visibly higher bobcat activity in the semi-native pastures. I think there's uh, two or three distinct bobcat use areas, one in the South Marsh, one in the Northeast, and one in the Northwest. And that could be like a resident female in each of those sites. They, there seems to be kind of clusters of activity occurring in there. Um, and there, I also saw seasonal differences in cattle use, so more cattle in the semi-native pastures in the dry season and such. Now for daily bobcat activity, I saw clear crepuscular and nocturnal activity, and we also saw a nocturnal shift in activity during high cattle use days. So some questions for further study. Um, I'd like to maybe estimate bobcat population density using individual markings. And you can do that without actually having to tag uh, the bobcats or color them because they have individual markings on them. 
Uh, I'd also like to uh, use GPS collars to maybe show movement, uh, gauge their home, uh, home range size and activity centers at a much finer scale. And maybe the results from that could, you know, further back up what I found. Uh, also, I'd like to maybe uh, run a multi-species occupancy model to test interactions with other species. Um, such as another a competitor like a, a coyote or you know a prey prey species and also I'd like to use my methods to maybe test how human activity affects bobcat occupancy and detection anyways uh, big thanks to uh, everybody at the predator prey lab Joe Guthrie, Raul Bowen, Steve Blaine, Shram Narasimhan uh, all the Archbold interns, uh, Archbold staff, Buck Island Ranch staff and interns. And also this project uh, was made possible um, through an, a cooperative agreement with the USDA uh, and a special thanks to Ryan Miller and Jesse Lewis and Mikey Tabak for making uh, this data set that I worked with pos possible. Again, any questions? Thank you, Gabriel. Um, if there are um, there are questions, um, let's see. It looks like we have a few in the Q and A. Um, <clears throat> the first question, um, Gabriel, I'll ask: If you were to repeat this study, do you think the ten photo plus five minute rest period was sufficient for your needs, or would you change that at all? I think that's that's fine. But what I I might do is um, instead of having um, that whole data set be like including those 10 images, maybe just reduce it down to one. Uh, so um, if I saw 10, I'd just count it as one um, to represent one detection and that might be easier to work with. But no, I think, I think that, that is a sufficient amount of time for, for Bobcats to move uh, and around and yeah, there's there's gonna be uh, the same bobcat passing by and such, and that's just kind of a, um, a a byproduct of how these camera studies are set up. Gotcha. Okay, I'll ask uh, uh, another question here. We've got a, a bit of time. How did the number of, of images of cows um, correspond to the animal use days database that we have in the ranch land management? pasture database? So yeah, that's that's a really interesting question and I really want to find that out. Um, I have that, I had that data set. I just didn't really have time to uh, work with it and kind of make it, made it, make it workable with, with my data, but it is entirely possible and it can be done. Um, it, it'd be interesting to see if they are, you know, uh, very like well correlated. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna come down to one final question here. Um, let's see. Um, do you think, Gabriel, there might be any differences between um, bobcats on the ranch and bobcats on the station? This question comes from Akeem. Um, in terms of kind of cattle interactions that you might have on the Archbold Reserve, um, uh, or differences in kind of the, the landscape um, and their habitat preferences? Yeah, I mean, I think that's also a really interesting question because the habitats are really different. Um, I'd, I'd be curious to see uh, what they think about like the reserve because the reserve is, you know, more grassland type. And also what they think about the, the scrub if they prefer that habitat or, or not. So. Yeah, I would think really differentiating uh, the habitat types and seeing which ones they prefer on the station would be interesting. And also the absence of cattle and the absence of, um, I, think, I think the absence of um, maybe a lot of human activity would be interesting to test on the reserve since there's mm -hmm. not that much human activity on the reserve. Yeah, that's a good question, thanks. Let me give you one more from, um from uh, Raul here, um, who says, great job. How did you deal with multiple bobcats in one image? I didn't. 
Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't. I, I'm not exactly sure how how you could account for that. And yeah, there, there's plenty of images that are taken with bobcats and their babies and such. But yeah, I don't know how Raul. Tell me how. <laughs> I think Raul would turn the question back on you pretty quickly. He took that away. <laughs> Okay, um, we do need to move on. Is that right, Laura? How's our time? Yeah, I think we should move on. We do still have several questions that maybe I can send to Gabriel to answer um, and just send out to the group later, if that's all right. That would be great. Because um, we do need to move, move on to our next speaker. There are some great questions.